Good morning, City Bridge. How are we doing? Good. All right. That was C minus at best, but we'll, hey, you know, you work with what you got. If I've not met you, uh, my name's David. It's great to be with you this morning. You know, uh, Chip and JoJo, they've got, uh, they got Demo Day, right? Everybody loves Demo Day. Well, here at City Bridge, we have New Series Sunday. And I'm super excited about New Series Sunday because we're, we're starting what will be an eight-week series on the letter to First uh, Peter. And I'm really excited about our time together. So one of our core values is to be, at City Bridge, is to be Bible-based. And there is no better way to be Bible-based than to spend time slowly working through the individual books of Scripture. And so I'm really excited about the next eight weeks, what the Lord might do through this little letter. And so in you know, when Chip and Jojo, when they go into a house, they, they, they take a house that is in not dire need of repair. And at the end, they've got this magnificent, newly renovated house. And, uh, and in between the beginning and the end, you get all this heavy lifting in this work. And I think what we're going to find in our series and our study of First Peter is that like a renovated house, uh, believers are going to go through some things, some suffering... And that suffering is meant to produce something that in the end is way better than what we started with, okay? That's what I hope we're going to be reminded of as we go through First Peter. We're going to spend the bulk of our time this morning doing an overview of the letter, just like we did in January in the book of Colossians, just like we did in June in the book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to devote the better part of an entire Sunday to an overview. And the reason we do that is because... We think it's real important before we start diving into the individual pieces of 1 Peter that we have our arms around the letter as a whole because, and here's the thing you need to take note of, the parts only make sense in light of the whole. The parts only make sense in light of the whole. And so we've got to understand if 1 Peter's going to make sense to us, we've got to understand some context. And when I talk about context, I'm referring to uh, things that circumstances and background and settings that all will contribute to our ability to understand and apply this little letter. Things like historical context. What was actually happening at the time this letter was written? Who was in power? What were the events or the circumstances that contributed to this letter? The cultural context, the social norms, the traditions, the beliefs of the folks that were living in this time period, the, the geographical context, the physical location, the setting, that impacts <clears throat> how things unfold. Our literary context, what's the genre, the structure, and the surrounding text that can help provide meaning to our individual passages. So all these things, and there are others, but all these things shape how we understand and interpret a particular passage or letter. So before we go and just dive into the individual parts of 1 Peter, we're going to take the old, <clears throat> excuse me, the old who, what, when, where, why approach to getting our brain around the context of 1 Peter. Sound good? And then, as a bonus, if you call now, we're going to cover the first two verses of the letter at the end. Okay? All righty. Well, everybody, buckle your seats and uh, put your tray tables up because we're about to take off. Who wrote 1 Peter? Well, 1 Peter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I think Peter wrote 1 Peter. And not just because he says he wrote 1 Peter, but because I think we're going to see some things in the letter that point to Peter as the author. There's reasonable evidence internally within the letter. And then from the very earliest times, the church history has no problem attributing this letter to 1 Peter. Now, if you were to do a deep dive, if you were to really go deep in studying 1 Peter, you would discover that there are some folks who don't think Peter wrote 1 Peter. And I think that for every argument that they present, there is a, a strong and rational argument for Peter's authorship. I do want to touch on one argument against Peter's authorship that I think is important because, and I'm going to unpack it because I think it has implications for how we understand how our Bible was written in general, how our New Testament was written. So the thing about 1 Peter is that the, first, the Greek that we see in 1 Peter is some of the finest Greek in your New Testament. The Greek in 1 Peter is better than all of Paul's writings. It falls in quality behind the book of Hebrews and it falls in quality behind Luke, the Gospel of Luke and Acts, who were both written by the Dr. Luke. And so that's 1 Peter. 2 Peter, on the other hand, 
is much less refined. It's more rugged. So if, if first Peter is Shakespeare, then second Peter is your drunk uncle Clem. Okay. That's kind of what we're seeing here. And so if you believe that Peter wrote both letters, and I do believe Peter wrote first and second Peter, we have to account for the quality of Greek in first Peter and the lack of quality in second Peter. And the way we do that is through what's called an amanuensis, an amanuensis. That may be a new term for a lot of us. An amanuensis was um, an ancient scribe. Think about it as a professional scribe. And in the ancient world, not everybody could read or write. And so if you were going to send a letter, you might need to have somebody help you write that letter or clean it up. And so professional scribes were all over the place in the ancient Near East. They played an active role. There's nothing scandalous about this. This was just a part of it. In fact, Peter wasn't the only person to use a professional scribe. Uh, in Romans, Paul's scribe actually signs his name to the letter. In Romans 16, 22, it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. So now I wanna explain, to be clear, it wasn't like Peter sat down at his laptop and pulled up chat GPT and was like, pretend I'm an apostle and give me an epistle and out popped first Peter. That's not how it happened. And it wasn't like Peter sat down one day over a, bowl of matzo ball soup, and in one sitting, drafted First Peter. That's not how it happened either. The letter writing process would be that this, Peter or Paul or their guys, whoever's writing, would gather their companions. And in scripture, we see names like Mark, Sylvanius, Timothy, Sosthenes, and others. And they would have worked together with a scribe over days, debating and having conversations and helping Peter and those guys, they would refine their questions and answers. And then the scribe would take what he's listening and they would put that into writing and there would be drafts and there would be revisions and there would be clarification all under Peter's watchful eye. And in the end, there would be a final product that would then be sent in our case to the churches in Asia Minor. So consider Peter's background. Before he met Jesus, he was what? He was a fisherman. He was just out there counting big mouth bass in the Sea of Galilee. He wasn't highly educated. Now, surely Peter knew Greek, but it's a stretch to assume that Peter could have produced a letter with the quality of Greek that outshines the apostle Paul. That's just too much to ask. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And the way we best explain that is that in 1 Peter, Peter used an amanuensis. Now, who was that guy? Who was that scribe? The answers we're not real sure. Some people think it's Sylvanius as mentioned in, in 512, which we'll cover in the last week of the series. Maybe he was the scribe, uh, but the reality is we just don't know. But the point is here is that in the ancient Near East, this was common, and it doesn't diminish in any way the authority or the authenticity of this letter. Our theology does not hang on the process by which a letter was produced. The message, the heart, the care, the theology still came through Peter as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's how he would describe the process in 2 Peter. The scribe simply helped shape the language and the style to make it more refined and accessible. So that's how a lot of your New Testament letters are written. And that's good for you to be aware. Okay, so where and to whom was the letter written? Well, he tells us in 1B. It was going to folks in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. This letter was written to believers living up in northern Asia Minor. It was a circular letter, which meant it would have gone to one church and then gone to the other. So if you've got Italy, everybody knows the boot, right? We got the boot. We all know the boot. Here's the boot. Go right. That's Asia Minor. It's modern-day Turkey. Here's Africa. Here's, if you go up this way, you got Russia. Here's Israel. In Acts 1.8, Jesus says, I want you to be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the world. That's what we're seeing in this, these churches way up in Northern Asia Minor. The next slide zooms in a little bit, and you can see that this is also Asia Minor down here. But these letter, this letter was written to these folks up in the North. Okay, that's who they were. What do we know about these folks? Well, we know from Acts chapter two, that there were Jewish people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost listening to Peter's message. How do we know? Because Acts tells us, as Peter was giving his sermon, we read that the people were hearing his message in their own language. And we read that they're asking, how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians and Medes and Iliamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and other places. So we know that when Pentecost came, Peter's speech was heard by folks that lived up in this region. We also know from Acts chapter 16 that Paul and his crew were not allowed to preach the gospel in that area, which is weird, right? We read that, and they, Paul, this has been, the they is Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, 
having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they'd come up to my Asia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So they passed by and they went to Troas, and that's where Paul has his vision of the Macedonian man, and he goes to Macedonia. Other than that, we don't know anything more about these New Testament believers. We don't know who planted these churches. Based on everything in Scripture, there's no indication that Peter spent time there, and yet we've got this letter. And as we read the letter, as we unpack it, basically what, we can, what it seems to picture is that we've got a church full of primarily Gentile believers. Why do I say that? Because repeatedly in this letter, Peter's going to say some things. He's going to make some statements that you would not make if you were teaching to a primarily Jewish audience. He says things like he refers to their former ignorance. He refers to their, refers to their feudal life they inherited from their forefathers. Peter would never say that about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were once not a people, but they've now received grace and others. So there were certainly Jewish believers in, this, in these churches, but the predominant makeup of the church would have been Gentile believers. So that's the, the, the who. Now, when was it written and where was it written from? Best we can tell, we think Peter wrote this letter sometime between 64 and 68 AD, which would have been not too far ahead of his death, his martyrdom. He's gonna say at the end of the letter that she who is in Babylon who's likewise chosen, sends you greeting. Peter indicates that he's writing from Babylon. And we know, we'll explain more in the last week, that Babylon was his way of referring to Rome. Okay? So Peter was writing this letter from Rome. Now, that's your chips and your salsa. That's your appetizer. Let's get into the fajitas, the main meat. Why did Peter write this letter? All right. Peter wrote this letter because Peter cared for God's people. And he knew that these fellow believers were struggling. He tells us his purpose at the end in 1 Peter 5, 12. I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Exhorting and declaring the true grace of God so they could stand firm in it. Now, why the need to write a letter to a bunch of churches that, so far as we can tell, Peter never visited? The simple answer was this. They were suffering, and Peter was a shepherd. Peter was a pastor. Peter loved Jesus Christ. And that meant Peter loved other people who loved Jesus Christ. And so when Peter heard that there were believers in Northern Asia who were suffering, he wanted to help them understand their suffering. He wanted to be able to help them ground their suffering theologically so that they could know that they're loved, that they're not alone, that they might be able to stand firm. Now, I do wanna talk about suffering conceptually because it's the theme of this letter, suffering. It's all through the letter. And it's also one of the bright red strings of your New Testament. And I think it's helpful to take a moment just to talk about the New Testament concept of suffering. First thing to know, there's two primary terms in your New Testament for suffering, Greek terms. There's others, but the two primary ones, one's called phlipsis, one's called pasho. Uh, pasho is, is translated, you'll see it as suffer, suffered, suffering. Pretty simple. Phlipsis is translated as, you might see it as oppression and tribulation and suffering and affliction. Now, there's, again, others, but these make up the vast majority. Fortunately for us, the only term in 1 Peter is the pasho and its related terms. They show up 16 times in the Greek. If you were to do a search by word, it would show up 17 times in English, suffered would, but it's actually only 16 times in the Greek, which, by the way, accounts for 27% of the use of that term in your whole New Testament, which means we ought to pay attention, okay? So when we talk about suffering in the Western world, Okay, the way we talk about suffering, we think about things like stage four cancer. We think about things like being fired, there's mass layoffs, and you've been let go of your job. We think about the guy that crossed over the center line and smacked into your car. Um, we think about um, children who have betrayed parents, and we think about that as suffering. And that, to be clear, that is suffering, okay? But that's not how the New Testament speaks of suffering. Suffering in the New Testament, first Peter included, speaks of suffering in, in, this is an oversimplification, in three ways. It refers to suffering in what I'll call the sin-suffering equation. So we see in the New Testament that the writers move away from the equation that if you are suffering, it's because you're in sin. And that's a theme in the Old Testament. The Jewish people got into trouble and got into trouble and God disciplined them because they were disobedient to the Mosaic covenant. So in the Old Testament, if you were suffering, it was because they thought you were in sin. See also the book of Job and his friends. Okay, that's one. And the New Testament moves away from this. 
the fact that you're not suffering in the New Testament doesn't mean you're righteous, okay? The second one is what I'll call a cosmic conflict. The New Testament speaks of suffering in the context of a cosmic, co cosmic conflict between God's people and Satan. And Satan and his minions are actively seeking to destroy and to bring harm and to pain in this world. If God would allow it, Satan would bring this building down on us right now, okay? But the providence and the sovereignty of God prevents it. And lastly, what I'll call innocent suffering. Okay, so while I get that nobody's innocent, truly innocent except Jesus, and he, by the way, he suffered. The New Testament concept of suffering is that you can suffer, you will suffer, even though you haven't done anything wrong, okay? This is 1 Peter. You're suffering not because you've done something wrong, but because you are identified with Jesus Christ. That's 1 Peter. What am I saying? I'm saying that in this letter and in the New Testament, the high percentage, high, high percentage of times it's used, suffering is used in your New Testament. It refers to external persecutions from people, leaders, the devil, and it's related. So uh, this is true in both, both terms, Pascio and Philipsis. Now, when Jesus and his guys, when they run up across physical illness or disease, they pray for healing. That's your New Testament model. When Jesus and his guys run up against disease as sickness, they pray for healing. And Jesus never says, never believes that physical illness is good for the individual person. They pray for healing. It's never good for the individual person. When it comes to suffering, when Jesus and the apostles talk about suffering, they do say, hey, there is something about suffering that's good for the individual because it's going to produce something good. And they pray for endurance for suffering. Does that make sense? The difference? So um, as we unpack this little letter, we need to remember that the suffering that these believers were facing is exclusively focused on their persecutions because they followed Jesus the Messiah. Now, all that said, here's what I think the Lord wants us to hear this morning. Whether your suffering comes from persecution like these believers were experience, experiencing or your suffering comes from living in a broken and fallen world where things like stage four cancer exists, where things like, uh, you know, uh, tsunamis come, or whether you're suffering because you've made some really poor decisions and you're suffering from that. The Lord wants you to know that he wants to use all of that to increase the quality of your faith, to help remove your desire for the things of your flesh, to create greater empathy for others, and to remind you to remind us that we are not home, okay? Now, what else do we know about the suffering? Well, we do know that the persecutions that these believers were facing was not empire-wide. This wasn't, there wasn't an official policy of Rome to persecute Christians. To be clear, that would come where becoming a Christian was outlawed, but that's not what these men and women were facing, okay? They were facing localized persecution. So even in Rome, when the fire happened in Rome in, I think, 64 AD, and Nero blamed the Christians for the fire, and he did awful things to believers. I mean, you talk about uh, persecution and death and suffering, but even that was localized to Rome. It wasn't pushed out empire-wide. What these believers were suffering was localized and regional. When we look at, the, at 1 Peter in the context, the picture that emerges is that we've got believers that were experiencing discrimination, they were being ostracized and harassed and slandered and insulted. Okay, that's what was going on there. Very real forms of persecution. And there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of talk about them dying for their faith. Now, I would assume, and I think it's fair, that on the extremes, there were believers that were dying for their faith in Northern Asia Minor, but that was the exception. Most of it was this other kind of, of um, persecution. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves is why? Why would a minority group like Christianity at this point, why would that be a threat to the empire of Rome, the might of Rome? And the reason that to understand that, and this will also help us with our New Testament in general, we have to understand the, uh, Rome's policy of conforming tolerance. That was an official policy in Rome. Conforming tolerance uh, allowed Rome, when they conquered a new territory, when they gobbled up territories, Rome would come in and say, hey, listen, we're gonna let you continue to do your own thing. Your religions are fine. You can kind of maintain your local form of government. You can uh, feel some sense of autonomy. This was great as long as you conformed 
to the overarching Roman authority, taxes, the fact that now you're being occupied by an outside force, and you don't pose a threat to imperial stability or control. So that meant conforming tolerance meant that, that, that you had to respect Rome's traditions, you had to respect Rome's religious practices, and you had to participate and you had to acknowledge your allegiance and worship of the emperor who's seen as supreme. Okay, through that lens, can you start to see why Christianity would have been problematic for Rome? Because as Christians, we're exclusive in our worship. We worship Jesus the Christ. We don't worship the Roman pantheon of gods. We're, uh, we, we allege ourselves, we bend our knee to Jesus, not to the emperor. We, we reject they rejected many of Rome's social and religious customs. And this made them appear as antisocial, as maybe even dangerous to the traditional Roman order. Early Christians met in homes, sometimes secretly. And this made people feel like they were something to be suspicious about, is this a subversive group. And so it's easy to see how over time, as Christianity grew, it became more and more of a stench to Rome. And one day, it would become illegal to be a Christian in Rome. But we're a hundred and so years in front of that. Right now we're dealing with ostracism, confiscation of property, maybe imprisonment, and as I said, maybe on the outer fringes, death. Now, fast forward to 2024. America, we don't have an official conforming tolerance policy, not in law, but let's be honest. We have an informal conforming tolerance policy and that stench is getting stronger and stronger each day. There's incredible pressure for us as believers to conform to the godless cultural norms that are becoming commonplace in our culture. In the name of tolerance, Christians are being pressured to not just, not just accept, but to endorse ideas and beliefs that run smack in the face of Christianity, of your scripture. If you wanna be labeled as intolerant, here's all you gotta do. Raise your hand and say, I believe in the Bible. And I believe in the way the Bible speaks about marriage. I believe in the way the Bible speaks about gender and sexuality. I believe what the Bible says about the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as the only means by which you can be saved. I believe in sin and accountability. I believe in judgment. And all of a sudden you are an intolerant bigot. We live in a country that screams that, hey, you can believe whatever you wanna believe. But the subtext is just so long as what you believe lines up with what I believe. You feel the pull just to go along to get along? I do. I, I do. And this is one of the reasons I'm so thankful we're going to spend the next seven weeks and 15 minutes-ish, plus or minus, probably plus, in the letter of 1 Peter. Because I know the Lord wants us to know the true grace of God, and I know he wants us to stand firm in it. Okay. Now, from the why to the what. What was Peter's message for these believers? Okay. Here's your big idea for the first Peter. As God's chosen people, believers are called to endure suffering with hope, following in the footsteps of Christ, trusting that their trials are going to serve to sanctify them and prepare them for the glory to come. Peter wanted to give these folks hope and encouragement, okay? And he's going to do that through his letter in three big blocks of content, okay? By the way, we have a chart that you should have gotten when you walked in. This is also online. Stick this bad boy in your Bible. And you can use this as you're studying to remember kind of where am I in the context of the letter, where, where am I? And so Peter's going to attack this in three big bulks. First, he wants to make sure that his readers understand their identity as the people of God. Because if you're going to stand firm in a world of persecution, you better be clear on the nature of your salvation, on the life you've been called to, and the role you play in this cosmic war. That's 1 Peter 3. I'm sorry, that's 1 Peter 1, 3 to 2.10. The second big block is here. It's the response. It's what does it look like to live out this identity? Peter's going to say that the people of God are to live like Christ in front of the unbelieving world. They're to live like Christ in front of the government's leadership. And they're to live like Christ in our day-to-day -day roles as slaves, as masters, as husbands and wives, as children, and as believers in general. And he's going to say that we're going to need to suffer like Christ suffered. That's 1 Peter 2.11. To 411. And the third big block, as he's going to say that, hey, in this last one, there's some responsibilities. The judgment is coming and it is going to start within the church. So he exhorts the elders of that church, of the churches to lead well. 
And he exhorts the rest of us to clothe ourselves in humility, to be ready to resist the devil, to be ready to suffer well as we wait for Jesus Christ to restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us. That's 1 Peter 4.12 to 5.11. And one of the things Peter's going to do is he's going to draw an analogy through this letter. There's a lot of Old Testament quotes and even more allusions. He's going to draw an analogy between the people of God in the Old Testament and members of the present church. And by the way, when I say analogy, analogy does not mean identity. The church has not replaced Israel. We don't believe in replacement theology here. God still has a plan for the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the descendants of Israel, okay? So, but he's gonna use this message to help them see. So like from Joseph in Egypt, from King David fleeing in the wilderness from Saul, from Daniel in Babylon, the Old Testament narrative presents a picture of God's people, just like Peter's readers, who are aliens and strangers in the world, okay? And Peter's got, he's gonna, he's gonna teach that, unpack that, through five messages through the letter, okay? He's gonna say, one, you should expect suffering as a Christian. If Peter, and by the way, the rest of your New Testament, including Jesus, is to be believed, then a faithful church will suffer. So if Peter tells these believers, don't be surprised by suffering. Don't be surprised by this fiery trial because it's a test of your faith. Suffering for Christ is part of the Christian experience. And if you came to Christ because somebody told you Jesus wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. You were sold to build goods. That's why the prosperity gospel is so anti-Bible because it goes against everything the New Testament says. You will suffer if you follow Jesus. And by the way, as you go through this, I want you to take note. Peter never disparages and he never slanders the non-believers who are dishing out hostility and persecutions. And he doesn't encourage his readers to. He doesn't cast blame. Peter refers to those people as idolaters and as slaves to their fleshly lusts and desires. Note that Peter never calls on his readers to lash out against their persecutors. He calls them to live lives in such a way that it causes the unbelieving world, the people that are persecuting to say, hang on, how do you have so much hope when I'm being just such a jerk to you? That's what he wants them to live like. He calls them to do good. Note that Peter never encourages his readers to withdraw or crawl in a hole. You wanna make a difference in this world? Then you need to live differently in this world in the way you love and forgive and pursue peace courageously. Look, I get, <laughs> there's a lot of times I'm like, man, just hole up in a monastery in the Alps, sounds pretty good. But that's not what Jesus calls us to. We gotta be in the world, but not of the world. Second, to suffer is to share in Christ's suffering. Peter encourages these believers to see their suffering, to place their suffering in a way that shows them you are participating in the sufferings of Christ, okay? If you say you love and serve Jesus, then there's joy and there's purpose in knowing that even fractionally, you're experiencing some of what Jesus experienced when he was rejected by man. Place your suffering in the context of Christ's suffering. Third, you suffer for doing good, not for doing evil. Peter emphasizes that if Christians suffer, it should be for doing good, not because you act like an idiot. Suffering for righteousness sake, Peter would say, is commendable to God. Suffering because you're a jerk is not. And I can't tell you, I mean, ugh, how many times this knucklehead has suffered because I've said something dumb or I've gone off and let my anger have its way. And I don't think Jesus is like, yeah, nailed it. He's like, no, you're suffering because you're an idiot. Don't be an idiot. If you're gonna suffer, suffer because you're following Jesus. Four, he wants you to grow in your faith and obedience while suffering. The key verse in your Bible, so if you got your Bible, this is where you circle or you highlight or you asterisk, whatever you do is 1 Peter 4, 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. When you suffer, trust God and do good. There's an assurance that God is just and will ultimately reward those who endure. And five, Peter wants them to remember the temporality of suffering. This is a key theme in 1 Peter. Peter sees suffering through, the, through an eschatological lens. What I mean by that is that Peter views their current sufferings in light of the end times. He's gonna talk about repeatedly about the final judgment in chapter 1, 3 and 2, 12 and 4, 4, 4, 7, 4, 17. He makes it clear that suffering precedes judgment and salvation. We stand firm 
We endure short-term suffering for Christ on this earth as it prepares us for the revelation of Jesus Christ, the salvation of our souls. Okay. Everybody still with me? Okay. That's our high-level overview of 1 Peter. Everybody still sitting up straight? If you're asleep, time to wake up. <laughs> We're now going to take a peek at the first two verses of 1 Peter. Okay? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. We've already talked about Peter. There's only one Peter in the New Testament. Simon, son of Jonah, from the town of Bethsaida, whom Jesus renamed Cephas, translated the Greek, Petros, works its way to us is Peter. And I really like Peter. Peter's life encourages me because Peter has got some pretty epic highs, but boy, howdy, he's got some pretty epic lows. Consider, Peter was the guy who immediately leaves his old life behind at a chance to follow Jesus, immediately. We would put that in the that's awesome category. Peter's the guy who on behalf of the other 11 disciples makes the official proclamation that Jesus is the Messiah. We'd put that in the, that's pretty cool category. But right after he says that, like literally next breath, he rebukes Jesus or he tries to, as Jesus talks about the suffering that he was gonna endure, he rebukes Jesus and Jesus says to him, hey bro, you're Satan and your mind is not in the things of man. We would put that in the not so good category. Peter was the guy that Jesus specifically calls out as the one disciple who's going to outright deny him. We'd put that in the not so good category. Peter was the guy who spectacularly denied his savior with curses before a teenage servant girl and some other knuckleheads who were watching Jesus go through his kangaroo court. Not so good. Peter was the guy who was incredibly restored by the Savior he spectacularly denied. That's pretty cool. This isn't even up there, but Peter was the guy who shortly after he wrote this letter told Rome, I'm not worthy to be crucified upright like my Savior. So if you're going to kill me, you turn me over, you crucify me upside down. That's Peter. Peter encourages me. Because it reminds me that spectacular failures don't represent the end of your story. I like me some Peter. To those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. We've already talked about who these folks were, but note that Peter calls them the elect exiles of the dispersion. The Jewish people use that term diaspora to refer to their brothers living outside the promised land. So if you know your Old Testament, we've talked about it. The Jews were deported by Assyria and by Babylon to the other parts of the world. But Cyrus told them, hey, you guys can come back. And some of them did, many of them didn't, which, by the way, was a mistake. But those that didn't, they call the Jews of the diaspora, the dispersion. At about the time Peter wrote his letter, there's, I don't know, somewhere between two and four million of these Jewish people living outside the promised land. And Peter picks up on this term and he uses it as an analogy for the church. Communities of God's people living outside of their native land, outside of their true home, outside of their heavenly city. He's reminding these Christians that you're temporary exiles. You're dispersed. You are not in your true home. Verse two, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood. These believers may have been suffering, but Peter said, you got some pretty good things going for you guys. You were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. The Father just didn't predict their salvation. No, no, no. Their salvation originated from the very heart of God and the intention of God. They didn't reach out and grab God. God reached down and grabbed a hold of them. They were chosen in the sanctification of the Spirit. God's Spirit reached into their lives to make them a holy people, both in the moment of their conversion and in the days and weeks and months of years that followed, sanctification involves both the cleansing and the defilement of past sins, but sanctification also involves the ongoing refinement into Christ's likeness. The Spirit just doesn't 
clean up your old life. No, no, no. He introduces and brings about a whole new life. Having been chosen by the Father, having been sanctified by by the Spirit, the only appropriate response is obedience to Jesus Christ. The actions of God are meant to produce a reaction. And that reaction is obedience under the Lordship of Christ, who, by the way, like you, church in Asia Minor, was also rejected by man. Having been chosen by the Father, having been sanctified by the Spirit, it leads not just to obedience, but to a cleansing through the sprinkling of blood. Now, I don't know about you guys, but the term sprinkling of blood is not in my daily lexicon. It's kind of a weird phrase. What does Peter mean? Well, in the Old Testament, the sprinkling of blood occurred three times. One time it occurred at the beginning when Israel agreed and entered into the Mosaic Covenant. That's Exodus 24. When they said, hey, we're in, they were sprinkled with blood as a way, to, as a way to, to seal the covenant. The second time, that was a one-time event. The second time event was when, when um, uh, Aaron and his sons were ordained as the priests of Israel. That's Exodus 29. They were sprinkled with blood, set apart. That was a one-time event. Third instance was a repeated event. And that was when you had a, somebody with leprosy or a skin disease, when they were cured, when they were healed, they would go through a purification ceremony and they'd be sprinkled with blood. That's Leviticus 14. And that happened every time somebody was healed. And I think Peter's referring to this last scenario. While God intends for these chosen believers to live in obedience to Christ, Peter understands that we're gonna have missteps. We're gonna sin, we're gonna fall in our weakness and our humanity. God gets that. And these believers could rest knowing that there was a continual figurative sprinkling of Christ's blood that cleansed them. God's plan for us, for them, is not obedience dogged by unforgiven sin. It's obedience where our failings are continually cleansed by the blood of Christ. And then he closes verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. This was a sort of a common way to end a letter. It was made, I'm sorry, to begin a letter. It was made really... Paul was the one that primarily used it and started it. And Peter just says, hey, I want there to be grace and peace in your life, but I don't want it just added to your life. I want it multiplied. I want it exponentially. I want you to experience grace and peace on an exponential level. That's 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. I mentioned at the beginning about our dear friends from Waco, Chip and JoJo. And if you watch Fixer Upper, which I did in the past, I haven't much lately, you got an hour show with commercials. You got 45 minutes of content. And you're starting with this house in need of repair and you're ending with them pulling back the signs, you know, the big signs. Welcome to your fixture upper. And there's tears and there's all that stuff, which is okay. Yeah, you know, it's okay. What we don't get great clarity of is all the work between starting demolition and renovation and the end. We get some highlights, but we don't see all of the hard work, all of the sweat, all the times you hit your, hammer, your thumb with a hammer that happens in the, in the renovation process. But we do see that in the end, you're ending up with something far more valuable than what you begin with. And so my hope for us as we start this series on 1 Peter, that we remind each other to appreciate and and come to, to grips with the life that the Lord's calling us to through Peter, a life of not belonging to this world. Look, followers of Jesus are people who don't fit into the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. Our deepest loyalties, our deepest desires, they're going to run up against the things the world tells us to desire and to be loyal to. This is not an easy road. And Jesus never told us it was going to be easy. Look, if you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to follow Jesus, it's incredibly inconvenient. But that's what we're called to, to lay down our lives daily and pick up our cross to follow Jesus. Peter's calling us as strangers in a strange land to embrace our identity as the chosen exiles of God and all that comes with it. And he's calling us to do it together. So that's what we're gonna do for the next seven weeks. Father, thank you for First Peter. Thank you for preserving this little letter for us and that we could some 2,000 years later look back and be reminded of the true grace of God, that we might be able to stand firm in it. Father, I pray for my friends in this room, as we live in a world where conforming tolerance may not be written on the books, but it is certainly the current we swim in. And I pray 
that we would be a people that do not fall prey to the godless currents that this world is pushing us in. I pray that we would be a people that stand firm. And if we're going to be a people that stand firm, that means that I got to be a guy that stands firm. And I know I need help. So would you help me? Would you help our friends? Would you help us to see suffering as something that you want to use regardless of how painful, regardless of how long, regardless of how heartbreaking it is, that you want to use it for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.